like everybody else, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this fabulous place. I've never been here before. It's lovely. Um, right. So, I, yeah, so I guess I, I, I think I'm supposed to, to end in an hour and 40 minutes or something like that. So I think I will also try to remember to have a break in the middle so you guys don't completely fall asleep. Um, if I forget, let me stop me. Also stop me at any time. I'm trying to uh, trying to do this at a pace where people can understand what I'm talking about. Because if I don't do that, then nobody will come to the third lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so, what am I talking about? Cohomology of automorphism groups of free groups. So, basically, there are some groups that I'm interested in, and they act on some nice spaces. And from this information, we get information about the groups. So I have to describe three things to you. I have to describe the groups. I have to describe the spaces and the action. And then we can start talking about cohomology. So I'm not sure that I'll actually get to cohomology this time, but we'll see how far I get. So what are the groups? So first of all, I'm going to talk about a free group. My free groups are always finitely generated. I'll generally call the generators A1 up to AN. And I'm interested mostly in their automorphism groups. But inside these automorphism groups, there are the inner automorphisms. <coughs> And we'll also be particularly interested in the quotient group, these are, of course, normal. So out of Fn is the quotient out of Fn mod in of Fn. So inner automorphism is conjugation by some element of the group. Um, free groups don't have any commuting elements, except for proper powers. So inner, the inner group of inner automorphisms is actually isomorphic just to the free group itself. Every different element of the group gives a different inner automorphism. So we have this map from 1 into Fn, to out of Fn, to, oops, why did I draw that? to uh, out of Fn. One. And so this is a short exact sequence. It's not split, however. There are finite subgroups of out of Fn which do not lift to finite subgroups of out of Fn. So that's basically the instruction to splitting here. It's easy to, to make an example, but, and we'll see one eventually. So, free groups, of course, have almost no structure. They've got some generators and absolutely no relations. What that means is that there are lots and lots of automorphisms because it's very easy to, prove, to preserve structure for map, to prove, preserve structure if there isn't any structure there. So, out of that end, it's big. <laughs> out of that end is big too. Um, <coughs> so let me give you some examples of automorphisms. So Ulrika already mentioned one obvious type of automorphism. If I take these generators and I commute them, then to, prove, to uh, preserve there, so that's going to give me an automorphism. I can also take a generator and invert it. That 
there too. There's not gonna, I'm not going <coughs> to worry about preserving the living relations. Um, so that also gives an automorphism. Slightly more interesting automorphisms are if I take one generator and multiply it by another one. So take AI and multiply it by AJ. Now I have a choice. I can either multiply it on the right or on the left. So that gives me actually two different automorphisms. We we'll call the uh, right multiplication rho ij and the left multiplication And when I write this, of course, I mean that I don't do anything to the other generators. OK, so those are some easy, basic examples of automorphisms. How do I know an auto this is an automorphism? I, it's obvious how to invert it. It's a, uh, I take AI and multiply it by AJ inverse now, I'm going to get back to the identity. Okay, so that's an automorphism. So those are pretty simple automorphisms, easy to understand. Interesting theorem by Nielsen is that these generate out of FN. <coughs> So looks like a pretty simple group. Um, in fact, you don't even need all of those. In fact, you can get away with uh, rho i i plus 1 and maybe one of the epsilons. And uh, that, also, that already generates the group. Okay. So, right, this is supposed to be a, a, a session on uh, Lie theory, right? So let me just give a little bit, bit of uh, <coughs> let me give some connection to Lie groups, or Lie groups <coughs> anyway. So if there's a connection between out of and, and lattices. And Lie groups. In fact, there's a particular lattice in a particular Lie group which is especially closely connected. Namely, if I take the free group and abelianize it, then uh, the inner uh, right, the, this induces a map. So the commutator subgroup is characteristic. So any automorphism of Fn induces an automorphism of the quotient of Fn by its commutator subgroup, namely z to the n. So I get a map from odd of Fn to odd of z to the n, which is otherwise known as GLNZ. And in this, uh, if, I, if the abelianization takes, say, AI to the standard nth generator here, then it's clear what happens to my generators over there. Sigma goes to a permutation matrix. Uh, <coughs> I goes to something called ones, except for minus one of the by the space. And the row ij's go to standard elementary matrix, I'm taking my i generator and multiplying it by the jth generator. Over here, that corresponds to adding the jth generator. So that corresponds to the elementary matrix, which I'm going to call the ij. And notice that lambda ij also goes to ij. Actually, it goes to ejr. Columns or what uh, so the image of the columns are the images of the, uh, of the so it's the elementary matrix plus the identity or you, you call this the elementary matrix yeah. 
Okay. Okay, I was calling okay. that okay. elementary okay. matrix. Just, okay. Maybe you could, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> it's got once in the day. It has to be in GLM. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so in this map. <laughs> Uh, if I take a free group and abelianize it, if I do a, um, if I do an inner automorphism of the free group, when I abelianize, that'll be the identity. So the inner automorphisms are in the kernel. Uh, so I get a uh, map, so this map factors. Through the outer automorphism group. This kernel, this kernel here has got a name. It's called IAN. IA means identity on the abelianization. As any automorphism in the kernel, I guess, introduces the identity on the abelianization. And there's a corresponding uh, quotient by the inner automorphisms, IA and bar. <coughs> so Nielsen uh, right. Turns out that this map is almost surjective. And if n equals 2, Nielsen proved that the kernel is trivial. Sorry, I didn't understand. What do you, what do you denote by I a bar? This is a kernel of, so there's a map here too, right? So <coughs> the inner automorphisms are in here, and I'm going to take their quotient. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's the kernel of this map. Okay. Over here. So, uh, both of these maps are always subjective. For n equals 2, this map, we actually give it a name. How about pi? Pi is an isomorphism. In other words, i a to r is trivial. So this, this kernel, this IAN, measures the difference between out of Fn and the lattice in a particularly nice Lie group. Nobody knows much about this kernel. And let's go for history over here. Magnus proved IAN is finitely generated. And he asked whether it's actually finitely presented. It's equal pi. Sorry? We wrote, we wrote EP and we wrote pi. Yeah. Okay. So Magnus, and this is about 1934, I believe, proved that IAN is finitely generated, and he asked, is it finitely, gener is it finitely presented? So for n equals 2, yes. <coughs> for n equals uh, 3 in the 1990s, <coughs> uh, 60 years later, uh, Kerstich and McCool proved that IA3 is not finally presented. And for n bigger than 3, nobody knows. It's still an open question. Yeah? So the fact that rho and lambda go to the same thing, is that a sizable chunk? Um, yeah. So that so what's uh, rho times lambda inverse is conjugation of the ith generator by the jth generator. Yeah, so that's the, that's, uh, the inner automorphisms. It's a sizable chunk, but here's another one. If I take 
uh, generator and multiply it by the conjugate of two other generators. So A goes to B, C, B inverse C of A times B, C, B inverse C. That's some, some also in the kernel. And those are actually Magnus' generators. So there's, there's a, this is a sizable chunk, but it's not all. So by not, not finitely presented means that there are infinitely many relations uh, between right. the generators. Right, it means that you cannot write it as a, uh, <coughs> you cannot give a presentation for this group with finitely many generators and finitely many relations. Okay, okay. and as I said, nobody knows for n bigger than three. So it's a mysterious group. The difference between uh, odd of fn and glnc, that's a mysterious thing. Um, Nevertheless, there is some sort of a connection between odd of fn and lattice of Lie groups. Uh, I should say that uh, there, there's been, there have been a lot of results in, the, in intervening years that say that odd of fn behaves like a lattice of Lie group in many ways. It has various rigidity properties. It has various finiteness properties. Um, Right. It kind of looks, if you didn't know better, you might think it actually was a lattice in the Lie group. Yeah. Is it because, can you remind us, is it because H2 or I3 is not finitely negative? Um, that's one way to prove it. Uh, that's not how they do it. Yeah. That would be good if you could calculate H2. So has it been positive? No. <laughs> We would know if, it, if we had. So is the general expectation that since for n equal 3 is not finitely presented, it should be also for a bigger n, or there is some reason to to expect that uh, n equal 3 should be nastier than the other uh, examples in some sense? Uh, what's your uh, hint on the uh, What's my take? Yeah. Well, OK, this is, this is a digression from what I was trying oh, to give but, um, So uh, I can prove that in some dimension, the homology is not finitely generated. But I can't prove in which dimension. Okay. <laughs> um, I, su I suspect that it's not ever finitely presented. That's what everybody kind of thinks, but nobody can seem to quite prove it. There are certainly examples of groups where the uh, presentability goes up with the, the rank of the group, ah. right? I mean, like, yeah, no, I, I'm getting too far off. Too far. Okay, sorry. We can talk about it. Uh, right, that was supposed to be a comment. Oh, yeah. Um, so, automaton is not, uh, it's actually, you can prove, uh, this is Ivanov, I think. Out of FN, actually, we need to talk more about out of FN. It's not a lattice, a, a higher rank. So it's not a lattice <coughs> of the group. Of course, if that's if n is bigger than or equal to 3, if n equals 2, it's, at, it's GL2Z. And in fact, uh, Wrightson and Wade. prove that any map of a higher rank lattice in the out of Fn uh, has finite an in image. So in fact, not only is out of Fn not itself a lattice, but it doesn't have any subgroups that are lattices either, or interesting lattices. Okay, so, uh, so having connected myself to the topic of this conference, I just disconnected myself. Excuse me, when you say lattice, you mean a lattice in the semi simple yes. group? Okay. Higher rank lattice in a semi simple group. <coughs> Reductive, semi simple, all the, all the adjectives you need. Okay. Um, 
Right. Uh, so. <coughs> There's also a connection to mapping class groups. Uh, so this ties in with Ulrich's talk. <coughs> if you have a surface that she was like she was drawing, say an orientable surface with S uh, genus G with S boundary components. <clears throat> then the fundamental group of this is a free group, namely it's got 2G plus S minus, this is of course if S is bigger than zero. You have to have at least one puncture for the free group, for the fundamental group. So any diffeomorphism of the surface induces an automorphism of the fundamental group. That gives us a map from, and of course, homotopic diffeomorphisms induce the same map on the fundamental group. So that gives us a map from mapping class group to out of Fn. And, uh, right. Uh, since a homeomorphism doesn't necessarily preserve any base points, uh, it's going to be an outer automorphism instead of an actual automorphism. And Zishang proved that this map is injective. So in particular, the brain groups that Ulrika was talking about live as subgroups of out of Fn. And what subgroups exactly? Well, look at this guy. If I have a homeomorphism, it's got to take the punctures to the punctures. So there are these little circles. They represent conjugacy classes in the free group. <coughs> they're not, they're loops, but they're not base pointed loops, so they're just conjugacy classes. And what this is, is exactly the stabilizer. So these loops have to get sent to themselves by any homeomorphism of the surface. So uh, this mapping class group is exactly the stabilizer in out of Fn of these words, gamma 1 up to gamma s. Don't you mean out plus? Sorry? Out plus. Out plus? Oh. My mapping class groups always, uh, they can, I don't care whether the diffeomorphisms preserve a reverse orientation. Uh, yeah. I can put the plus or minus here or a plus here. Also, don't you need to preserve the product of those loops? Uh, this is enough. So, yeah. so on the nodes, I mean, the brain group. <coughs> the mapping class group over this with the boundary fixed. Yeah. Well, I don't think, yeah. You need to, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, here I have a, you're right. Here I have a boundary and punctures. It's an extra condition. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So where are we? Um, mapping class groups. So there's a connection with mapping class groups, but uh, I mean you can think of them as just subgroups of out of Fn. Okay. So that's groups. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Groups. So free groups are free groups, but if you're a topologist, the way you think of a free group as the fundamental group of a graph. So let's take a finite graph. 
and V, a vertex. Then I1 of GG is a free group. The easiest way to, well, the most obvious example of this is the one that Ulrich mentioned in her talk. Let's take a rose. Roses are red. Okay, so we want to identify the fundamental group of this with a free group. Uh, just uh, orient the edges, label them with the generators, and then pi 1, this is the canonical rows, Rn, and pi 1 of Rn. We're going to canonically identify with the free group. Okay, but of course you don't need to have a rose to have a um, I mean, lots of other graphs. There's a lot of other graphs besides roses. If I have any graph at all, finite graph. <coughs> and then groups do I have? There's a finite graph. Um, if I pick it and I've got a base point V, here I picked a base point, let me call it uh, V, the base point. Because really, I have to, uh, the to give this map, fundamental groups do have, have to have a base point to find a fundamental group. Mm -hmm. it, it's clear what the map is, right, between the group. Yeah. Okay. So give it any uh, graph. And a vertex in the graph. Then I have this uh, standard rows. And I can identify this, this free group. This fundamental group of this thing with the fundamental group of this thing. The easiest way to do it is to collapse a maximal tree. Say if I collapse this one, then I would just map A1. I would orient these edges somehow and map A1 to that, A2 to that, and A3 to that. And that gives me an identification that's a homotopy equivalence. And uh, right, it identifies the free group with the uh, fundamental group of that graph. However, there are lots and lots of other homotopy equivalences. There's no reason that AI has to go to such a nice extended loop like this. AI could go all over the place. A2 could go all, all over the place, A3 could go all over the place. Any map, which is a homotopy equivalence, identifies the fundamental group with the free group. identifies the fundamental group of the graph with the free group, and this thing is called marking. It's called? A marking. Okay. Okay. So, uh, right. So, right. The free groups are fundamental groups of graphs. If I want to see the free group as the fundamental group of the graph, I have to mark the graph. I have to give a homotopy equivalence between some standard uh, representative and uh, my graph. But in fact, whenever I have a homotopy equivalence, between a graph 
and another graph. I get a reduced map on uh, fundamental groups. I've got base points. Okay, so this is an isomorphism. If that's a homotopy equivalence, that's an isomorphism. Homotopy inverse. Now, if these things are marked graphs. then that gives me an isomorphism between this group and the free group. So the composition gives me, I guess I should dot that, an automorphism of the free group. same as G2, then uh, <coughs> I get a map from homotopy equivalences of G1 to automorphisms of the free group. And homotopic homotopy equivalences give me the same answer. So I get a map from by zero of this. So this is what, again, what Ulrich was talking about. Um, and the, the exercise is that this is an isomorphism. Okay? So you have to, you know the generators, so you have to realize every generator by an automorphism, and then you have to show that if two realize the same automorphism, they're homotopic. So that's an answer. Okay, so I can think, I can geometrically realize automorphisms of free groups as homotopy equivalences of graphs, of base pointed graphs. Now, in topology, as we noticed for mapping class groups, you don't always want to worry about where the base point is. Sometimes you want to think about homeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms of something, and you don't want to restrict, you don't want to make them preserve the base point, because there are diffeomorphisms that don't. So if you forget the base point, then you get a map from homotopy equivalences of a graph. And instead of going to automorphisms, it goes to outer automorphisms. Because to get an actual map, you have to choose a path to the base point. And if you choose a different path, you'll get a conjugate answer. So again, this doesn't depend on the homotop homotopic paths. Maps give you the same uh, automorphism. So you get a map to this, and you also get an isomorphism there. So here we didn't have any base points. We weren't worrying about the model. Here we had one base point. There's no reason to stop there. Why not put in S base points? So if G is a graph, point I, and V1 of the V of S are distinct, points. In 
G, then I can define gamma and S, finite graph pi1 isomorphic to Fn. Uh, gamma and S is going to be pi naught of the set of homotopy equivalences of the graph that have to keep V1 and Vs fixed. <coughs> Are points, vertices, or can they be any points? They can be any points. If it's not in a vertex, make that a bivalent vertex. So let me just give you a couple of. Uh, so uh, gamma n0 is out of Fn. Gamma n1 is out of Fn. But there's a whole sequence of groups there. Some of them are really easy to understand. Uh, I'm already down here. So what about gamma 0s? What does that mean? I've got a graph of rank 0 with s marked points distinct marked points. Okay? So that's going to be a tree. And I'm going to put <coughs> the S marked points <coughs> at the end points of the leaves. Uh, I may as well. Otherwise, I can just hold to everything that's outside of the marked points away and get the same space. And so we play that multiple equivalent spaces are the same groups of self-multiple equivalents. Okay, so gamma zero s, uh, there's an example. And if I have a homotopy equivalence that fixes all these points, well it's homotopic to the identity. Something like that. And that's a homotopy equivalence. It's invertible. 
Okay, and it's, if I do it twice, I get back to where I started. So that's a Z2 inside this group. Here's another element in the group. I'm going to take, I'm going to, it's going to be the identity of the whole, on the whole white part. But I'm going to take, so in particular, it's going to send that point to itself. So, and this point has to stay where it is. That point has to go to itself. But I don't want it to be trivial, so I'm going to send this guy all the way around that circle. So there, I can do that, that's an element, it's got infinite order, I can do it as many times as I want, so I get a copy of Z. And then of course I could do with this edge and this edge and this edge and I get four Z's, except if I do all four of them, then that's homotopic to the identity by just rotating the circle back to where it started. Giving you exercises. So generator uh, gamma 1s contains a z only to the s minus 1 and it contains a Z2, and one of those is normal. Uh, I don't remember which one is normal. I'll keep it like that. Yeah, that's right. This one's normal. Um, so, and in fact, uh, it's a uh, This is everything. Okay? You understand if I if I, I just took this thing and twisted it 360 degrees, it would take every one of these edges all the way around. So if I map every one of these edges all the way around, it's the same thing as the identity because I can just untwist it. Is that clear? No. Okay. I would just love it if you drew the first one again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first uh, generator? The first generator. Okay. It's not 100% clear that it's new. Well, it is. Yeah. Um, there's, there's supports distinct. Right? So this, this oh, home is the first generator. is sends this edge, this pink edge, <coughs> which is that. Okay? And it's the identity on everything else. Okay, so the support of this, this map is uh, on the interior of that edge. The supports of these maps are all disjoint, so therefore they commute. Okay? So it is, in fact, <coughs> clear that those, those commute. And then the, this other subtle thing is that if you do this to all of these edges, you get something that's on top of the identity, because you can just untwist. I, I got somebody to watch. Okay. You agree that if I just twist this thing, then uh, all these things are going to go around like that? It's like <coughs> untwist. The use of the word homotopy is very confusing. The use of the word homotopy? In this context, yes. Okay. Because I'm not, you know, my homotopies don't have to preserve, well, they have to preserve those fixed points. But they don't have to preserve well, anything else. <coughs> For a non-expert, what's confusing is fair enough about preserving the points, but when you use the word homotopy, those edges might as well not be there. I mean, what is that? 
what does that mean in that, in that context? That's, a, that's, that's what I, I think is confusing. Homotopic, homotopic equivalences. Right. Uh, so in order, if I want to, so, so I'm describing homotopy equivalences of this particular model, right? If I have another model that I need to choose a homotopy equivalence, you like this one? Just with some marked points for him. Okay, so you have to choose a homotopy equivalence. <coughs> Both of these. And then you have to explain to me how this map have this composed with this composed to this. Whoops, sorry, that doesn't matter. What that map is. I'll tell you what it is. It's, you can think of it as taking your finger and pushing this, this point around the circle and back to where it started. But I find that more confusing than this, pushing a point around the circle. Maybe you don't. <laughs> But you, you agree that I can use any model for this graph that I want. I'm using this one because I think it's easy to see what the generators are. <laughs> and if I use a different model, I have to choose a homotopy equivalence between these two models to identify the homotopy equivalence up here with the homotopy equivalence down there. So, so it's a sort of way of encoding the homotopy equivalence <coughs> downstairs. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, oh yeah, so it's new. Um, Just, can, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Just in the case, S equal 2, is this uh, the deeply typing in the book? Or is it different? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, sure. So the action is by minus 1. Yeah. And in general, uh, can you, I, didn't, I didn't catch. How does Z2 act on Z2 is minus 1? What yeah, is by the changing all the generators to their negatives. Okay, it's just a diagonal matrix minus 1. So yeah, that's right. Um, I think this might be a good, uh, so this is a good place to take a five minute break because I've, I've now introduced you to all of the groups I'm going to be talking about in the next few lectures. Direi che il gruppo delle commutazioni segnate è il modulo più o meno l'identità. L'identità, cammino in questa sarebbe la somma di tutti i Z2, che è un gruppo proiettivo di questo. Il duale di questo. Un po' per le mani.
essenziali che dovevano essere scoperte, essere scoperte, 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 scoperte,
so what do I need? I need to say some, they span, the, they span R to the N, so I need to say um, uh, uniform lattices. And R to the N, but then I've got this rotation thing going on, modulo rotation. And I've only written SLN instead of GLN, so I, uh, and also by scaling. Okay, so that's one way to think. So here's an example. Here's a two vectors in R2. Those are the columns of the matrix, and I get a lattice. Okay, so I could also think of this as actions of z to the n on r to the n. The ith generator z to the n acts as translation by the ith vector in the lattice, uh, by the ith column of the matrix. Actions of z to the n on r to the n, again, modulo, rotation, and scaling. Or, I could also think of the quotient of the lattice. The quotient of R to the N by the lattice is a flat torus. Uh, right. Excuse me. Yeah. You mean in or PGLN? Right. I was the. You have to worry about homothetics if you use GLN. So I was going to. Yeah, but you're depending on by scaling, so. In, uh, in well, I was, when I, after I went from SLN, I was, uh, yeah, okay. I was thinking of uh, this space as a space of lattices modulo scaling. Okay, my, my lattices all have volume one. But I've, if I just talked about, I could either say lattices of volume one, or I could say all lattices modulo scaling. Either way, okay? Is that all right? You don't look happy. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can do something. Sorry? Because uh, when you divide that by scaling, I think the question that in the oh, in even dimension, you're, you're not including this by something in the SLN, but in the PGLN. Uh, okay. Um, this is what I want to say. This is the space I want to look at. Uh, yeah. Let, let me leave that. Um, so I actually should say this is not just lattices either. Thanks uh, for bringing my attention here. So I don't, I don't just have a lattice. I don't just have the vertex points. I also have the sides of the lattice. I have the vectors. So they're actually marked lattices. Okay, so they're lattices, but they come together with the basis for the lattice. Uh, actions of z to the n on r to the n, modular rotation, or I could think of these as marked flat tori of n dimensional. Then I don't have to box scale. Then I don't have to worry about rotation, for instance. That's, uh, if I rotate this picture, I get an isometric marked flat torus. Okay, so that's my model. So I want to find spaces for all of these gamma NSs. I'm going to start with, uh, uh, for simplicity, let's assume S equals zero. <coughs> and I want to look at that picture up there and think, what can I do? So GLNZ. I'm sorry about being sloppy about SLN, PLN, etc. But GLNZ is a group of automorphisms of Z to the N. Yeah? And out of FN, out of FN is a group of outer automorphisms of FN. So I might look at actions of the free group on something, modulo, modulo something, modulo some scaling. Or I might look at marked objects with fundamental group FN. 
modulo scaling. Okay, so that's the idea. So we have uh, marked objects with fundamental group Fn. So <coughs> points are going to be, well, instead of tori, they're going to be graphs, because that's what has fundamental group GN. Marked graphs uh, G. Okay, here again, the marking gives me a basis for the fundamental group of the torus. That's what the, the vectors here in my picture do. After I wrap, wrap this up into a torus, it's going to give me a basis for the fundamental group. And the same thing when I have a marked graph, the leaves of the rows gave me a basis for the fundamental group of the graph. Okay, so points are going to be marked graphs. And there's no rotation here, but let's just do a lot of scaling. Or I can assume the volume of the graph is equal to 1. What do I mean? The, yeah. Right. What do I mean by the volume of the graph? And what do I mean actually by scaling? <coughs> so, can I ask you a quick question? So you don't, you don't contract a maximum tree, or you don't have a base point, or anything like that with a marked graph? No. Well, I'm not a best include zero. I'm not, I'm not <coughs> I don't want to worry about base points to make things confusing. So the leaves of the, of the RM just go, we just pick up the loops, right? And loop to the graph. Yeah. Uh, well, no, they may go around lots of different. Yeah. I mean, they may not be embedded, right? The, the yeah, but the loops, no, they are not super close, but they are right. loops, right? Yeah, they're loops. It's just n loops in the graph, exactly. Just like, that's just n vectors in the torus, n loops in the torus. Mm -hmm. Now I have n loops in no. my graph. Three loops. Sorry? Three loops, no base point. Three loops, no base point. They're just well, loops, loops that represent a basis of the model. They're, they're loops that represent a basis, yeah. So they're not exactly free loops because uh, there's a subtle, you can't just take a set of conjugacy classes that, uh, so that some <coughs> elements of the conjugacy classes contain, contain a basis. That, that set of conjugacy classes has to be a basis. And they share a common base point, right? Yeah, right. This map sends a, yeah, sends the, sends the vertex somewhere. So all these loops share a base point. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. And, and they also have a number. Yes, they also have a number. And orientation. OK, so um, I'm getting into trouble here because I've been talking about graphs. And now I want to do things like scale them. And uh, yeah, how do I do that? Well, I can't just talk about graphs anymore. My marked graphs are going to have to have metrics on them. OK. And then it makes sense. So metric graphs means the, the edges have lengths. Have a positive real lengths. <coughs> Although if you're a physicist, you might want your edges to have um, complex lengths or quaternionic lengths or momentum lengths or whatever. But anyway, we're going to have positive real lengths. And uh, I'm going to make a volume one. It means that the sum of the edge lengths is equal to one. probably imagine all sorts of things like, whoops, it's disappeared, taking a circle and putting millions of, of uh, univalent vertices of 
stickers on it, uh, thorns on it. I don't want to think about that either. I don't have any marked points to worry about, so I'm going to assume all vertices have valence at least three. So I don't have any stickers sticking out. I can't just sprinkle bivalent vertices all over the place. That's going to be a point. I think I've got everything. Oh, yeah. <coughs> And then, of course, uh, I'm going to draw a picture in a minute. And then, of course, I want to, if, uh, so I've got G and G. I want that to be the same as G prime, G prime, if there is an isometry. <coughs> you know, they're basically isometric, and these things can be. So G G prime, these are marked. Uh, H. And I want the, the, this diagram to use. Again, up to on the top. Okay, so I think I finally de de determined, defined a point and the symmetrics in the, what I, it's going to be a symmetric space and it should be motivated by this picture up here. The point in the standard symmetric space for SLNR is a marked flat torus. Uh, so the flat is, tells the symmetric information and I've got scaling. All right, I'm assuming the volume is equal to one and this is a, um, kind of a non-degeneracy <coughs> condition, you don't want tori with little random edges sticking out of them, for instance. You just look at the tori. Okay, okay. so let me draw some pictures. Uh, start. You really can't draw pictures after rank two, but in rank two you can. <coughs> Close to. Okay, so what kind of graphs <coughs> with all of my um, conditions have fundamental group F2? Well, there's this one. And I can mark it any way I want. I could also look at this one. And I could also look at this one. That's it. Those are all the graphs where the vertices are at least trivalent that have fundamental group F2. So in this one, I've got edge lengths x and y. And I'm assuming that the sum of the edge lengths is equal to 1. So I have a simplex. In the middle of the simplex, there's the one where the edge lengths are equal. Towards the end, the x loop is really tiny. And towards this end, the y, y, y loop is really tiny. So these are, if I take some marking, then the marking obviously deforms along with the graph. And I get a whole um, interval of points in my space. Incidentally, this space has a name it's called outer space. In a minute. Okay, so there's, yeah? If you replace the, uh, instead of free homotopy, you say base point preserving homotopy, would you get an honor space? If I have space? base points in all my graphs, I get, a, yes, I get honor space. Exactly. But I wanted to keep things simple. I, if I put n base points in, I get the same thing. Okay, uh, so that's, that's good. Um, what is this business about equivalence? Uh, this marking, A, B. Supposing I have the simplest marking I can imagine, I send A over here and B over here. Well, if I sent instead A up this way and B down that way, 
That's the same point. There's obviously an equivariant, I mean, there's an isometry from this to this. Jamie flipped that, and it commutes with that, so flip. <coughs> this is the same, this is the same point as that. Okay, so that's this equivalence relation over here. If there's an isometry, it commutes. Yeah. Okay, so what about this guy over here? It's got three edges, x, y, and z. And it's got, so there's x, y, and z. And I'm assuming the sum of the lengths is one. So what I get is a two-dimensional simplex. In the middle, all the, all the edges have the same length. I guess that doesn't look like it's in the middle, does it? Um, over close to this edge, this is x equals 0. So the graphs look kind of like this. There's a little <coughs> edge there. Uh, if y equals 0, that was the middle one. They look almost like the rows, etc. <coughs> so, we draw the simplex. This is the, uh, a, I've marked the rows, I've indicated the, the marking by, by that. If I collapse the middle edge, I get that marked graph. So this this is a triangle. This edge is also in outer space. Notice that uh, this vertex is not in outer space because if I collapse this edge, this loop, all the way to zero, I no longer have a graph of rank two. So and so these vertices are all missing. And then this is the same thing as this. So there's, there's another simplex over here that looks just like it, except the B is going in the other direction. Yeah? So does this look almost like a patch in that space? Yeah. <laughs> but then how do you talk about it, right? Patience. <laughs> okay, so um, I can I can do this. Uh, I can now collapse a different edge and go to a different rows. Maybe it looks like that. Flip one of these guys and go to a new new triangle. Uh, yeah, so that's what these guys look like. What about these guys? So I've got three edges, A, B, and C, uh, X, Y, and Z. So I still, I, I'm, again, I'm going to have a triangle. If Y equals 0, I'm going to get this. If X equals 0, I'm out of outer space again. Or if Z equals 0. So all this stuff is all not in there. It's at infinity of outer space. I don't know what that is, a black hole or something. Okay? So, uh, right. There's another way to expand this into, somehow these things are always yellow. And this whole business, it's a yellow simplex <coughs> corresponding to that, but it's, it's coming out of the board. Okay. So, the whole picture. Alex. Here's a uh, convenient way to draw this picture. You may have seen this picture before somewhere. Stop there. Wow. <laughs> Practice that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a picture of all of the trivalent graphs. Uh, 
I mean, of all the um, theta graphs. And then coming out on each of these, so the, the edges here are all roses. And coming out of each of these rose, rose edges, I should call them maybe pink, is, uh, you know, there's another fin. I won't draw it. It's coming straight out at you. So this is outer space. For n equals 2. And you shouldn't be surprised at what it looks like. Because if you remember the beginning of the lecture, Nielsen proved in 1924 that out of F2 is GL2Z. So this is the picture you always see for SL2Z, like in the fairy graph. And it's not surprising that the, the space we built, which was supposed to be like a symmetric space for GL2, for out of F2, looks a whole lot like the symmetric space for SL2Z. Okay. It has a couple of minor uh, differences. One is these things. These uh, fins coming out of the, of the board, they weren't there in your picture for SL2Z. And in fact, in general, outer space is not Sorry, so, I didn't understand the relation between this picture and the SL2Z. So there's a map um, out of F2 that goes out here. And if you look at the picture, you can see that there's a map out of F2 that goes out here. And this is a nice morphism. Ah, okay, it's not direct, it's via this, uh, okay, this thing, okay. You can okay. make it direct if you want, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in general, this is, this is what happens if you have a co-dimension one face like those edges. They're generally in four co-dimension, in three co-dimension zero faces. So it's not going to be a manifold, because otherwise they'd just be in two. Okay, so. Uh, but is it compatible? Yeah. This theorem. Proved by Mark Fuller and myself in 1986. We haven't got past 1986 yet, I'm afraid. We did move from 1924 up to 1986. Um, outer space is contractible. Uh, the stabilizer, uh, oh yeah, right. I haven't talked about the action yet. Uh, is that the <coughs> logical thing to do next? Yes. Oh yeah, I did want to make one comment. So there was this other description of the symmetric space is a space of actions of z to the n on r to the n, logical homothetian rotation. So I can also describe outer space as a space of actions. The points in here are gone. They're marked graphs. The marking identifies the fundamental group with the, with the, of the graph with the free group. The fundamental group acts on the universal cover of the graph, which is a simplicial tree. So, and in fact, if you take the metric here and move it upstairs, the action is by isometries, by deck transformations. So outer space can also be described as a space of actions, just like the symmetric group as a space <coughs> of free actions of Fn on metric simplicial uh, trees. And in fact, this description is used in much of the literature about outer space. So if you decide you want to learn more about outer space, you'll see this all the time. 
it's a nice description because it's easy, it's easy to generalize to other situations. Okay, but outer space is contractible. Um, so what? So we have a nice space. I'm not interested in a space unless it's got a nice action. So, so the, this metric exhibition here still have volume one normalized or not? Uh, I'm, I've normalized my grass in a volume one. So there. Yeah. Oh, these trees? Yeah. Homothetic classes of trees. Okay. Yeah, good point. So what's the action of an element of alpha fn? So if you, uh, let's think about, lift it to an element of odd of fn, then you can realize it on a rose. Your standard rose Rn. by some map, F. So what I mean by realize it is, I want to give a map of this, of the standard rows that induces this map on the fundamental group. So it's, all, it's easy how to write such a map if uh, phi tilde of, of ai is wi, then you just take your edge ai and send it around uh, <coughs> the appropriate loops that spell out wi. Okay. So you can realize any automorphism by a homotopy equivalence of the rows. Okay, so now how do I want out of it then to act? So I've got a graph and a marking. That's a point in outer space. Uh, I realize P by F. And I get the same graph with a new markings. I don't know why I put it way over there. But anyway, so here is a point in outer space. I apply my automorphism, I get a new point in outer space. The graphs are isometric, same graph, nothing's changed there. The only thing that changed is the marking. And this is the way SLNZ acts on, on uh, the space of the tori, right, or lattices. It doesn't change the lattice, it only changes the basis of the lattice. Yeah. Um, right, so g, g dot phi, I claim is equal to g, g of f. So you have to check a couple of things. First of all, that it doesn't matter if you change this by an inner automorphism. <laughs> get the same point in outer space. And if I have, yeah, I that's what it looks like. But it is. And then the stabilizer of GG. Well, we saw a hint of what it's going to be when we talked about, did the example for n equals 2. If you have an isometry of the graph, it doesn't move the point. Isometry of the graph induces a map on the on its fundamental group, and in fact, the stabilizer turns out to be just exactly the group of isometries of the graph. In particular, it's finite. So now we have a proper action, at least. What's the quotient? Uh, I didn't give outer space a name. It 
it's often called CDM. I guess I'll call it CDM. That's what it is in the literature. But um, so what is this quotient? Well, I have metric graphs. The action changes the marking. So if I mod out by the action, I have metric graphs with no marking. So what I have is a moduli space Mg N are metric graphs And again, I'm not, no, all vertices are at least triangular. Um, yeah. Right, the theorem is, so I act, so what do I have? I have a, a proper action of my group on a contractible space. So, if this was a free action, I'd be very happy because Hurwitz proved that if uh, G discrete acts properly and go compactly on a contractible space X. then x mod g is a classifying space for g. Which means that if I want to learn, so it doesn't matter what contractible space, this is always true, so if I want to learn things about my group, I can study this quotient space instead. Um, in particular, if I'm interested in the cohomology of my group, I can compute the cohomology of the space instead, which is what we're going to do, but not today. Let's see, what did I want to say? Uh, action is proper, space is contractible. I can decide what I can say in a few minutes still. Oh well, yeah. Did you say this is or you it's not a free action. It's not a free action, the stabilizer is finite. Yeah. Um, so this is not an E G, it's a E underlying bar G of C. It's an E under bar G, yes. Um, a couple more comments before I get into the cohomology. Uh, well, we actually need to interrupt, actually. Notice that the quotient, that the spaces, these triangles are all missing their vertices. So if I take the quotient by the action, I'm going to get a space that's not compact. So, mg. This is to answer Alex's question. If mgn is not compact. This actually makes geometric group theorists unhappy because we like to have spaces that are quasi-isometric to our groups. So this means, in particular, that MGN is not quasi-isometric to our group. But, um, right. So this is very much like in the symmetric space. You take the, the portion of the symmetric space by SLNZ, you get something not compact. You get the modular surface. There's an obvious way to compactify it. What's wrong here? All these points are missing. So stick them in. Okay. So CVN is contained in CVN star. 
which is called is the superficial closure. Excuse me. Yeah. I'm confused about your, your this statement of which you will first find space. Uh, space with so one milligram G and all the higher homotopy groups in the If I take G finite and get to the point, and it's put the minus and minus essential. But the action is free. Okay. But it's like freely. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, freely. Thank you. <laughs> and co compactly, what, uh, what means co compactly? Ah, it means the quotient is compact. And I actually have it, um, that's a good point. So it's my, it's my space co-compact. Uh, no, it's not. Actually, you don't really need it uh, to sorry. have a class time space. I'm not sure I can talk for two hours straight. Um, <laughs> acts freely. This is all I need. Yeah. On a contractible space that, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So, is it okay now? Yeah. yeah. So, is this compatibility equivalent? In other words, does the action of Alton other than extend? No. No. Uh, it's actually not so easy to see from this description. There's another description in terms of sphere complexes where it's very easy to see. But I'm not doing that. No. This thing does exist. If you add all the missing faces, you do get a space. The action extends, and you get something called a superficial closure. When you look modulo the action of out of that thing, <coughs> instead of the moduli space of graphs, you get and moduli space of graphs, which is something which you might call the uh, the lean Mumford compactification. So that's a nice co-compact space. Uh, th this is compact, and that's compact. I should I should try to convince you that it's compact. <coughs> You said something that these are not manifolds, right? That's right. But how far away from manifolds? Just the you know, co-dimension? No, they're very so kind of manifolds. In general, the the link of a of a sim of a point is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres, but it's not a sphere. It could be in rank three, you get uh, the link of a vertex is homotopy. Well, depending on which vertex, it could be homotopy equivalent to eleven two spheres. Instance, doesn't look much like a manifold. But still, like something like a coin. Yeah, co that's common to call it. That's, that's yeah. Is it easy to see? No, <laughs> it's not. In fact, I wrote a paper in my first attempt. The referee found that I was wrong. So I don't think it's easy. <laughs> what, what What is the description of the boundary of the elements of the boundary? Um, yeah. To give you the nicest description, I really ought to talk about sphere systems in three manifolds. But that would take some time. But, uh, I mean, basically, it, the points in the boundary, the way you know how to obtain them, you take a graph and you collapse some edges to zero, you collapse a subgraph, the edges in a subgraph each to zero, and that subgraph contains a cycle you're going to go out to infinity. So you could think of it as a pair, a point at infinity is a pair consisting of a graph and a subgraph with a cycle in it. But then there's an equivalence relation that you have to worry about. Uh, well, I'm getting going all sorts of different directions. Uh, I'm losing my thread here. Why? Yeah. Why is it compact? That's a good place to end. Why is the space compact? 
The point is, as for n equals 3, which we've lost, in n equals 3, there are only three graphs meeting my conditions. n equals 2. n is 2. n is 2. Clearly time to stop. There are only three graph graphs meeting all my conditions. You're all, the people, you know, anybody who knows what about the Euler characteristic can prove that there's only a finite number of graphs meeting my criteria. Every vertex has to be at least trivalent. The Euler characteristic has to be 1 minus n. Okay? So the types of graphs, unmarked graphs, correspond to simplices, open simplices in the quotient although some of these simplices may get folded up. There's only, the fact that there are only a finite number of graphs in my space means there's only a finite number of simplex quotients in my, um, in the <coughs> quotient, which is going to transfer to the fact that there's only a finite number of, uh, after I add all the simple points in, as long as I don't put holes in my simplices, the quotient's going to be consist of just a finite number of simplex types. So that means that the space is compact. So, uh, so this is co-compact, meaning the quotient is actually compact. It has a defect, though, as if you're a geometric group for yours anyway, or uh, even a if you like cohomology, the stabilizer of a single point up here can be infinite. I can move that simplex over there, over there, over there, over there. There's, uh, there's automorphisms that uh, go around the simplex, and so that's a whole infinite. There's a z's worth of, uh, of of uh, simplices that share that simplex. And uh, there's a z's worth of automorphisms that send simplex to simplex to simplex. So the stabilizer of this point is actually infinite. So this is compact. The quotient's compact here, but the stabilizers up here are infinite. So we don't like those spaces much well. Some people like this. Tropical geometers like this a lot. Tropical geometers rediscovered the space. They call it the um, space of uh, tropical, um, tropical curves. Yeah. Sometimes they like this one instead of this one. Um, and they've been proving lots of theorems about many theorems you can find in the 19th and 19th years. Mm. <laughs> 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 I said too much already. <laughs>